It's an immense pleasure and honor to have uh, Gabriela Coleman here. She holds the Wolf Chair in Scientific and Technological Literacy, Literacy at McGill University. Trained as a cultural anthropologist, she researches, writes, and teaches on computer hackers and digital activism. Her first book on free software, coding, freedom, the ethics and aesthetics of hacking has been published with Princeton University Book Press. And her book, Hacker, Also Whistleblower, Spy, The Many Faces of Anonymous, is published by Verso 2014. And I have to say that both of these books are absolutely fantastic. I think they dragged me through the last uh, seven years, so I highly recommend it. Um, before I introduce a bit today's topic very shortly, I want to state also that this is a collaboration with the University of Oslo, the Department of Cultural Studies and Oriental Languages, and thanks to Helge Jorta, I'm also very happy that he's here, and this is a very nice note in the network. But it's also a collaboration or uh, a core of the Podium Heresis series, a series run in Polio since about two years, um, based on a community of artists in the space over the river, an actual space. And it's important to mention that I have to say. Yeah, um, I'm sure some of you know uh, Podium, or many of you, it's an artist run space. We are based in Kausmania. Uh, our main work consists in exhibitions, but a very important part is actually this Heresy uh, series of talks curated by Susanna, and uh, uh, for us it is important because uh, it very much addresses the, uh, the issues of contemporaneity, not only from the artistic level, but also more from the academia, and we would like to kind of, uh, touch upon these very important issues that are happening today, and especially this talk today is very relevant, uh, I think. And uh, I'll do a bit of self-promotion. We are having a show, this, which is still open by Kaitana Ferre, uh, open on weekends. Uh, check out our website. And also one thing is that this talk is live streamed on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and also, uh, and also marks the pilot of my uh, artistic research project called Planetary Sensing, Navigations Below the Surface. Starting with full gear in September 2018 and spinning and circling around questions of ecological and social justice, future cohabitation, communication among modern human species, structural violence counter narrated with art and science, anti colonial strategies, and lots of code, lots of embankments and cosmologies. Core pilots on that spaceship with me will be. Marine organisms that navigate between life and non-life, comrades of various species, and weird ecosystems where the political intersectionality also plays a key role. Rights of nature come into play with poetical ethics, and I'm quoting one of my core collaborators who's unfortunately not here, Denise Ferreira de Silva, um, with that term poetical ethics, and I think it will resonate in the talk in maybe a weird way today as well. Um, so I'm, I'm very, really deeply happy that uh, this has happened, um, or is happening right now with you and on the net. Especially in times when war and the fascists are at the door, let's learn other languages, codes and communication patterns, mushrooms, algae and coders of various species, as that to me is hope. Quoting Coleman, giving an example of the hacker Seth Schoen in 2001, who rewrote the program mathematically as a haiku, or to be more exact, as 465 individual haiku strung together into one epic poem, meant for the judges overseeing the legal cases. Schoen passionately defended what he purely mm -hmm. described as controversial math and poetry. His text implores how yet technical communicants deserve free speech rights. See how numbers, rules, patterns, languages, you don't yourself speak yet, 
still should in law be protected from suppression called valuable speech. For various reasons, this is a jigsaw falling into place with relation to legal sensibilities. And central is the law, reinventing and creating different legal regimes, but there's not a divide between the digital and the physical. So many reasons why this was my favorite invitation to start the project as an early spark of it, but also emphasizing why this is an important topic of research within the contemporary arts, now where a reboot of agency should be imagined and worked on with. The example of embodied collectiveness, anonymous is special in discouraging and criticizing, fame-seeking and social peacocking, enacts a critical practice of egalitarianism and solidarity, again quoting Coleman, maintaining a critical space for those whose ethics deviate sharply from the logic of individualized branding. Technology not as a new mythology, but with concrete political and historical conditions. Again, quoting Coleman, as Rise Up members, I'm a big fan of Rise Up, state that technology is not an end in itself, but rather an aid in the creation of a free society, a world with freedom from want and freedom of expression, a world without oppression or hierarchy, where power is shared equally. A hail to complexity and diversity as ideological sensibilities that animate hacker politics with diversity. Ethics and aesthetics with memes, masks, mimicry and camouflage outside the comfort zone and uncanny maybe too. Please welcome. Uh, so much for that great introduction. Um, and it is really nice to be here. Uh, it's been long in the making to sort of um, try to get myself here. And people have been very patient because uh, I was coming to Terrace for a couple months. I was like, let's wait till I'm here. Um, and so I'm finally here. And I'm really excited to give this talk uh, here in particular because I think it's in one respect, um, a lot of things I'll be saying is going to be very kind of obvious or familiar to an audience that works in art. Um, but at the same time, I also hope that um, it will kind of validate many of the sort of commitments and practices that artists engage in. So I'm just going to kind of start. So I'm going to be talking about anonymous and just uh, first a show of hands um, from people if you've heard about anonymous. Okay, so most people, great. Um, I'm not gonna you know, get into their history, although it's gonna come up a little bit in this talk. But you know, one of the interesting things um, about my research over the years is they're a little bit difficult to categorize, right? I mean, on the one hand, Suzanne mentioned the fact that there's a very strong anti-celebrity ethic to Anonymous. I think this is one of the most important elements. Um, but in part, because it's been used by many different which people around the world, it's a little bit difficult to pin down the phenomenon. So some of the words I've used to describe anonymous are hydra and trickster, confusing, enchanting, anti-celebrity. They're you know, really against surveillance or controversial. They're irreverent. They're interesting. They're wondrous, enchanting, unpredictable, frustrating, stupid, really stupid. Um, so these are all different kind of terms I've used at different moments in different operations. But one of the curious things is I've never really had to make the argument um, to the public, to lawmakers, to policy people that they're not terrorists. I wasn't confronted with this argument, oh, anonymous, they're cyber terrorists, and, you know, Gabrielle Coleman, as a uh, expert in this area, you know, you must convince us that they're not terrorists. And I think that's kind of interesting. Because what I'm going to do today is, um, first of all, talk about why I think this is an important project, the theoretical states. I'm going to give some proof that they escaped this frame. There were attempts made, um, which is why I'm going to go to point three, why it was conceivable for them to be painted this way, why they evaded it. Um, and that's the bulk of the talk. I think there's many, many interesting elements that help explain why a framework that 
you know, was kind of applied to them or could have been successfully applied to them, why they were able to escape it. So most of the talk is a kind of empirical story, but I just want to highlight at the beginning, before I get to that empirical story, why I think the stakes of this project are important. Even though I think from a kind of intellectual standpoint, um, it's well-worn terrain, but I think it's worth visiting this terrain. So as both an academic and an activist, I am very much interested in how the states, by which I mean usually intelligence services, um, and the media work to extinguish and disable the power of political movements, right? Um, and I'm interested in this both as an activist as well as an academic. And again, from a kind of scholarly perspective, this is well-worn territory. I mean, some, someone like Dick Hedbidge wrote about how the media um, kind of took away the power of punk uh, through their media frames. This isn't all that kind of interesting intellectually, but then I get to my point too, I think for those that are involved in political struggle, if you don't really think about both how to win hearts and minds through culture or fight against problematic framings, you're going to kind of lose the battle. And in the context of North America, um, this is where I get to point two, with this quote, politics is downstream from culture, um, quote from Andrew uh, Breitbart, who has this website, he's now dead, but Steve Bannon, uh, who was a big strategist for uh, Trump, is really, really aware that if you are able to kind of change the kind of cultural commitments, especially young people, you can recruit them uh, to your side. And again, I think this is not um, rocket science, but it is interesting when I was working on Anonymous, a lot of more policy uh, law type people would often discount Anonymous because they're like, well, it's expressive politics, it really doesn't have impact. And I'm like, well, no, actually, I do think that when um, there's political movements that really deal with questions of symbols, um, with art, uh, with ethical commitments, that's almost at a lower level. It's just as important as law and policy. And I feel like people wouldn't listen to me now because we're in this moment where cultural politics is part of the terrain where battles are being fought, it's a little bit easier to uh, get this message out there. But I think this is a good example of politics is downstream from culture. And related to this is about the power of symbols and popular media. Um, I'll be looking at, uh, for example, the changing role of the Guy Fox icon from the 1600s to today, very briefly. Um, but symbols change, and those symbols really, really matter to both inoculate groups from um, vilification um, and also can be a medium to inspire people. So these are some of the elements I'm going to be talking about. But just um, to kind of get to point two, politics is downstream from culture. There's a really nice piece by a German studies scholar at NYU um, that really explores how Steve Bannon uh, really is very smart at being a cultural producer. Film, websites, right? Um, this is the terrain in which he has worked in in order to kind of shift people's minds and hearts. And I think uh, while I'm not a fan of Steve Bannon, um, I do think having a Steve Bannon-like character on the left would be a very good idea. Anyways. So those are kind of some of the theoretical questions that we could talk about once I'm um, done with the empirical part of the story, which I'm going to uh, turn to. So very briefly, there are some people out in the world who do think anonymous um, and their actions equate with cyber terrorism. But I think they're in the minority, and I think it's a frame that hasn't stuck. And so I'm going to give little bits of proof of that. First of all, most news articles um, refer to them as activists or hacktivists, with very, very few referring to them as terrorists or even a dark, evil menace. The most negative kind of terminology tends to be that they're vigilantes, right? Um, and on occasion, Fox News in the United States did call them cyber terrorists, uh, but that tended to be the exceptions. 
So that's kind of one area you can go to. Another has to do with pop culture, which is both kind of proof that they escaped this designation, and it's also one of the most important forms of inoculation against um, the attempt to tag them uh, as terrorists. And I'm just going to give a couple of examples right now, but later in my talk, I'm going to really show how Anonymous has captured the imaginary um, among cultural producers from Hollywood to kind of very esoteric arts um, and was adopted in a wide array of places. And so again, it both appeared in Hollywood, Mr. Robot probably being the most famous example, where there were explicit storylines in the movie that made actual reference to things that happened in Anonymous. And the character um, uh, is also kind of loosely based on a kind of hacktivist character, right? So that's one example coming from Hollywood mass popular culture. Now I'm gonna give you another example that's a little bit more from you know, esoteric circles um, that also show that the hacktivist figure in recent times um, has become a laudable figure. And so it is a short clip of John Waters um, and RuPaul. Um, RuPaul does interviews in his car with you know, people he likes. So I'm just going to show the clip. Do you meet kids, young people today, who have that same irreverent sense of humor? And how have they changed? I think they're having just as much fun being banned as I did in the 60s. I don't think that we had more fun than they do. It's new. If you're a rebel today, you're sitting, you live with your parents, they haven't seen you in six months, they put food outside your bedroom door, and you're shutting down the governments of different countries on your computer. That's how you rebel today. You'd be a hacker. Yeah. And I always say, I don't want a hacker boyfriend, except they have bad posture. <laughs> <laughs> So again, I've collected a lot of examples of where the hacktivist and anonymous figure has been kind of adopted in different cultural spheres, and it's really widespread, as I'll show you later. All right, so now I'm going to turn to why they could have been vilified. You know, what are the factors that kind of put them in a good position to really slap this label onto them? Um, well, the first one, which is, again, not going to be any surprise to anyone here, um, but the use of the terrorism label has been used for many, many decades to contain, constrain, and rob power of all sorts of political movements, past, present, here and there, by which I mean Europe uh, and North America. And many people have written about this, and this is not to say that terrorism doesn't exist, it's just that there's many political movements or actors who really are quite unfairly put under um, the label, or um, and so, you know, some examples from the past uh, have to do with Nelson Mandela, who was on a terrorism watch list in the United States and the UK, eventually taken off, uh, but not too long ago. Um, in the United States, um, I think this is an interesting example whereby certain kind of police organizations were sort of claiming that Black Lives Matter was a terrorist organization. And I don't think this kind of label successfully uh, worked either. But there was a petition in the United States that was through the official White House uh, petition that did get 100,000 signatures, which is not insignificant. And also, the FBI um, has sort of identified black identity extremists, part of Black Lives Matter. Right? So this is one really good example where within this movement, um, there are these kind of moves to make those connections. Um, again, in different parts of the world as well, um, in Spain, puppeteers were kind of um, called out for possibly <clears throat> aiding terrorist activity. In France, there was the case of the Tarnac Nine. Um, whose case actually just finished, but they were accused by the French government uh, for sabotaging some high-speed rail trains. And for a period of time, they were charged under a terrorism law um, that was dropped. Uh, but nevertheless, that was another good example. And I've collected a bunch of them. I'm not going to give all of them. 
And actually, in most of these cases, um, Spanish puppeteers, I would say the Tarnak Nine, um, Black Lives Matter, the terrorism label has not stuck. But there have been some movements where the label, I think, has been successfully applied, and probably the most famous in the United States has to do with animal rights and environmental rights activism. Um, and so this, again, has to do with a complex set of factors, uh, one of which has to do with the fact that the FBI themselves considers animal rights extremists and eco-terrorism as a matter of our highest domestic terrorism investigative priority, right? Um, and so just because they themselves are sort of saying this is eco-terrorism doesn't mean that it was um, successfully applied to them, but nevertheless, actually in this case, um, there were, again, various factors which made the label at least credible in different publics. And this is a pretty good book by a journalist, Green is the New Red, who really looks at the ways in which, um, in the United States, animal rights activism in particular was successfully demonized as a kind of form of eco-terrorism. And uh, the effects have been quite interesting. Uh, for example, there was a group called the Shack Seven, um, who were a collective that helped run a website in support of animal rights activists to shut down an animal lab where there was testing against animals. Um, and let me just read the quotes. The Shack Seven campaign didn't involve anthrax, pipe bombs, or a plot to hijack an airplane. They ran a website. On that website, they posted news about the campaign, legal actions like protests, and illegal actions like stealing animals from labs and unabashedly supported all of it. Since the federal government has largely been unable to catch groups like the Animal Liberation Front and the Earth Liberation Front, prosecutors went after lawful activists in the spotlight. And most of the Shack 7 spent a couple years in jail uh, for doing this. And I'll get to the legal part in a moment, um, but the law that they were charged under initially um, was not a terrorism law, but by the time they got into jail, it was a terrorism law. And what's interesting is that, you know, definitely animal rights activism can be um, quite controversial and they do engage in acts of sabotage, uh, but there's never been any assassinations. Um, and so it's really quite concerning how in this domain, a monkey wrencher, a saboteur, is the same as a terrorist. And part of the reason why um, this label was able to be applied to this, we just have to do with the law under which animal rights activists are charged because it's a terrorism law. In the United States, the Animal Enterprise Protection Act became the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, right? And so again, even if the public doesn't necessarily believe it, when the legal statute is calling you a terrorist, it's much, much, much more difficult to be like, I'm not a terrorist. And even in the case of computer hackers, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, in the United States and different statutes in Europe are not terrorism um, acts. So this is a really good example um, of the way in which uh, a kind of priority by the intelligence services, legal changes, and I'm going to get to some popular cultural representations of animal rights activists later, um, show how a kind of movement can be at least partially straight-jacketed by this uh, framework. So that's the most obvious uh, reason why. Another reason has to do with the fact that there is a long-standing cyber warfare and cyber terrorism frame that has existed in many parts of the West since the 1990s. There's this idea that we can have a cyber Pearl Harbor um, and, you know, it hasn't happened, but nevertheless, starting in about the early 1990s, this is one of the first reports in the United States that made the claim that tomorrow's terrorists may be able to do more damage with a keyboard than with a bomb. And again, this is a discourse that has existed now, um, you know, for 30 years. That's quite a long time. And in some ways, a kind of 30-year discourse um, that many people are drumming, you know, many people are drumming the beat of cyber warfare, it's almost like you're looking for a perfect example uh, to um, be able to prove that cyber terrorism does exist. 
So that's another kind of reason. Another reason has to do with the fact that parts of Anonymous um, were really engaging in super high-risk hacking. I don't think this is terrorism, but it is sabotage. And I think the closer, uh, the more, the closer you are to sabotage, the easier it is to make that link, right? Because it's been done before with animal rights activists and uh, so on. So let me just actually quote this right here. These are two uh, breakaway groups, LulzSec and AntiSec, breakaway affiliated groups of Anonymous who really engaged in a lot of hacking. And this is a quote from Corey, Corey Doctorow, a science fiction writer, who wrote, in the kind of hacking that Anonymous does by means of the fluid, structuralist norms of the group, half macho posturing, half uber savvy media pranksership, is doubly exciting or exciting squared, it's filled with drama, betrayals, police informants, intimidation, brinkmanship, insane risk-taking, and impassioned speeches from the battlements. And just to give you a sense of that insane risk-taking, um, they had NATO, you know? This is a group who went after like one of the biggest um, military kind of organizations in the world, right? You're hacking NATO. You're telling the FBI on Fridays to fuck off, right? This is the sort of stuff that is inviting, um, you know, you're taunting the military world, you're taunting the FBI, you're putting yourself in a perfect position for the state to be like, well, you want to play that game? We're going to play it back with you. Right? And not everyone anonymous was involved in hacking. Anonymous is only, it's not only about hacking, but this is what was most visible in the news, right? Mm -hmm. And over the summer of 2011, when anti-sec was very big, um, this was a period of time where, first of all, I thought the FBI was uh, going to show up at my house. And I also really thought, ah, this is the time. This is the time where that cyber terrorism framing, which has been in existence for so long, Finally, they can apply it somewhere. Um, and you know what? Attempts were made at this time. Precisely after a lot of the hacking attempts were being made here and there, sometimes by security organizations. I'm not going to give an example. Here I'm going to give you, I think, the most interesting example that was made uh, by the state through the media. And so it was this article here in the Wall Street Journal that was published in February of 2012. It says, alert on hacker power play. US official signals growing concern over anonymous group's capabilities. And the article opens like this. The director of the National Security Agency has warned that the hacking group anonymous could have the ability within the next year or two to bring about a limited power outage through a cyber attack. Now, the terrorism word is not used. But to sort of say, hey, this activist group that you think is really good is going to maybe attack uh, the electrical grid is really making that association or putting down the pieces that that association could be made. This was really a big deal. I'm not going to say more about this because this is going to come up later in my talk, but nevertheless, this is kind of an attempt uh, by, I think, the state to start to make those connections. This is another kind of indication that the government um, really saw anonymous in quite negative terms and were really um, thinking about them in terms of um, you know, cyber attacks and possibly cyber terrorism. So uh, this is a piece on anonymous in New Yorker. So on March 8th, a briefing on cybersecurity was held for members of Congress at a sensitive compartmental information facility near the Capitol building. Many of the country's top security officials attended the briefing, including all these FBI people, uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security. So attendees were shown a computer simulation of what a cyber attack on the eastern seaboard's electrical supply might look like. Anonymous was not yet capable of mounting an attack on the scale, but security officials worried that they might join forces with other more sophisticated groups. And so um, when discussing the potential of these threats, we often use anonymous as exhibit, you know, A. So they were kind of front and center. There are other kind of examples, but I think that these are the best ones. So now I'm going to talk about why I think it was really hard to make them out to be cyber terrorists. Why there was kind of some attempts, but they failed. Um, and here, it's a kind of complicated story uh, with many different factors. 
that have to do with what they did to the symbols that they used, like the Guy Fox symbol. So that's what I'm going to turn to now. So I think one of the most important has to do with the timing and who and what they supported in their early activist history. Anonymous originally was a kind of trolling outfit that um, went on sometimes funny, other times quite fearsome pranking campaigns, harassment campaigns. And in 2008, they had a kind of metamorphosis where they targeted the Church of Scientology. It's a very interesting transformation. I can't get into the details. But this is when they started to kind of move towards activism in 2008. Um, between 2008 and 2010, uh, people in Anonymous who were involved in activism were fighting for the right to culturally share material. Um, and then there was a kind of decisive turn in 2010 and 11 when they supported WikiLeaks. Um, and so this is just the turn towards activism, and I'll talk a little bit about how they also moved away from internet activism and how that was important. But the WikiLeaks story is important as well. Uh, some of you might recall that in the fall of 2010, Anonymous, I mean, sorry, WikiLeaks released uh, diplomatic cables that were given to the organization by Chelsea Manning. And they dropped the cables, and um, this upset the United States government quite a bit uh, because it showed especially the hypocrisy, the dirty laundry of um, U.S foreign politics. And people were so upset at this that actually some government officials in the United States were trying to equate Julian Assange with being some, something akin to Al-Qaeda or terrorists, right? I mean, this was something that really upset the U.S. government. And interestingly enough, um, you know, WikiLeaks has become more and more controversial over time, right? But this was something that um, garnered a lot of support uh, from kind of liberal and left publics. Uh, the U.S. government was very upset, and they asked a bunch of organizations who provided services to WikiLeaks, such as PayPal, MasterCard, Amazon, hey, can you stop um, providing services for WikiLeaks, right? This was the kind of soft power um, financial blockade against the organization. And this was an interesting moment because a lot of people who weren't even all that crazy about WikiLeaks were very, very upset um, that the U.S. government could force companies into doing something when, at that point, WikiLeaks had never been charged with anything illegal. So this is just a British journalist um, after this financial blockade who asked, what have either Assange or WikiLeaks actually been convicted that allows Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, Amazon to withdraw services this week? And this is when Anonymous, for the first time, um, turns away from just piracy, supporting piracy, Scientology, and supports WikiLeaks. And they do so by engaging in a distributed denial of service attack against PayPal, MasterCard, Visa, and other financial organizations. It's really interesting how that came to be. Um, I wrote about it in my book. It was a little bit of an accident, um, but nevertheless, it was the biggest distributed denial of service attack as a protest that had ever come into being. Um, and it garnered kind of massive, massive attention uh, from the public, the news, and generally, actually, it was presented as a pretty positive thing. You know, a lot of people were like, wait a minute, this is really not fair that um, there could be this kind of uh, blockade. Uh, it's great that activists are rising up. And then what happened next was just as important. So up to that moment, Anonymous had been associated with internet issues or censorship. They went after Scientology because of a censorship issue, piracies, you know, about the internet, WikiLeaks is about the internet. But soon after, in December, January 2011, Anonymous gets involved with the first of the big social movements of 2011. And this is a really big deal for kind of many reasons, but I think this was particularly important as a form of inoculation because a lot of people supported these social movements, right? 
And there was anonymous front and center in a bunch of them from Tunisia to Occupy. And I'm now going to show you a little clip um, from Tunisia, uh, because people on the ground in Tunisia were incredibly pleased that anonymous got involved, because they were some of the first people to take some of the protest images happening on the streets in Tunisia and get that information to journalists in the West. And so they kind of, Anonymous helped open the door for the coverage in the West. And people in Tunisia were very, very well aware of this. I have a picture of a bunch of school children who are using the mask in a courtyard, and then another video of a group of people thanking Anonymous uh, because of this intervention. <laughs> with the Spanish Revolution, right, where Anonymous was both really involved and the Guy Fawkes mask became an important symbol. Uh, it was the same thing for kind of Occupy across uh, North America and parts of Europe as well, where, you know, by no means was Anonymous even the ones who called Occupy, right, into being. That was Adbusters. Uh, but nevertheless, at the time, Anonymous became a kind of informal propaganda wing of the movement. So much so that some people I know who weren't really involved in either Anonymous or Occupy just thought that Occupy was like Anonymous movement, right? And again, this is really, really important because had Anonymous just stayed um, fighting for internet type issues, it could have maybe been a little easier to tag them as a kind of cyber terrorist organization. But there they were in social movements of 2011, which had broad popular support. So that's one reason. Who did they support in the timing? So related to this has to do with the fact that Anonymous is flexible or incoherent. They have been involved in the social revolutions in 2011. They have fought surveillance. Here in Norway, they're involved in um, op, uh, an operation to stop whaling in Japan and Norway. They have gone after corruption in South Africa. Um, and I could just go on and on and on. There's hundreds of different types of operations that the name Anonymous has been used for. And this is actually a phenomenon that has been analyzed. Um, and it's uh, what Marco Desires calls an improper name. And an improper name, I'm going to have a, a long quote from him because it's a nice a little definition, but basically it's a collective pseudonym that can be used by different groups of people um, in different parts of the world to lay claim to different types of action. And Anonymous, I think, is the best example of an improper name, one that has really become global, where some previous examples were more contained. So Captain Swing um, from England uh, was a character that um, kind of farmers in England used to protest the introduction of new types of machinery, and people in different parts of England would destroy that machinery, and it would be done in the name of Captain Swain. So this was a collective pseudonym, an improper name. Another more recent one is Luther Blissett, which was invented by a group of Italian activists who are also into anonymity. They publish um, anonymously uh, novels. This is the Wu Ming Collective. And so they created this character of Luther Blissett, uh, which is a character that they wanted to release in the world so that other people can take Luther Blissett and anyone could be Luther Blissett. And Luther Blissett became quite popular in certain circles in the European West scene um, to lay claim, especially to certain types of pranks. And so this is a nice definition of what um, an improper name is from his book. On the one hand, a shared pseudonym allows its users to recognize each other for the simple fact of sharing a name. If you're Luther Blissett, I'm Luther Blissett, we're Luther Blissett. On the other hand, the alias brings with the same descriptive space 
actions and utterances that are produced by heterogeneous forms of association or organizations, some of which are collectivized and institutionalized, and some of which are more spontaneous and less structured. Drawing from these preliminary observations, I propose to define an improper name as the adoption of the same alias by organized collectives, affinity groups, and individual authors. An improper name is improper not only because it lacks manners of proprietary behavior, in that case it would only be inappropriate, but because it fails to label and circumscribe a clearly defined domain, what Michel de Sarteau calls a proper. Contrary to a proper name, whose chief function is to fix a reference as part of the operation of the system of signs, an improper name is explicitly constructed to obfuscate both the identity and the number of reference. So my argument is that with a symbol that has these characteristics, right, that it's difficult to pin it down. It's hard to pin that terrorism label uh, precisely because there's just too many meanings around anonymous. They've done too many things, right? And again, if you compare that to animal rights activism, you know, they do one thing. It's a singularity, this is a multiplicity, the cyber terrorism label is a singularity and becomes difficult to map to this uh, multiplicity. So that's really, really important uh, to the story. All right, but it also matters what symbol is used, right? So Luther Blissett, it's funny, at dinner last night, um, Helga is like, oh, Luther Blissett, I know about it because I'm really into soccer. Because Luther Blissett is an actual soccer player in Italy, right? Yeah, but he's English and then moved to Italy. And moved to Italy. Right. And this, this Luther Blissett um, is a composite, right? It's like takes the name of the soccer player, but it has other characteristics, right? Um, but it's still somewhat, the name is still somewhat identified with the soccer player, right? And people in Italy um, know this. Now the symbol most association associated with anonymous is not Luther Blissett, it's Guy Fox, who was the actual person, right? And this matters to my story. And this is probably the favorite part to, um, this kind of talk and narrative, for reasons that will become uh, clear in a moment. First of all, uh, the icon was adopted somewhat accidentally. People sometimes think, oh, you know, uh, Anonymous sat around a table and like, hey, Guy Fox would be a cool kind of icon to adopt. No, 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 that's not what happened. I mean, it was part of their kind of milieu, uh, for reasons I'm not going to get into, but when Anonymous first decided to protest the Church of Scientology, and they did so on the streets. They knew that the members of the church would take high-definition photos of them and harass them. So they're like, oh, we need to cover our faces. What is you know, a mask that we could all buy that's easy to buy? And people are like, Guy Fox mask. And so they you know, showed up on this global day protest with a mask, and that's the moment where the icon was associated with Anonymous, because prior to this, it was a headless uh, man in a suit, or it was a suit man with a green mask. It wasn't Guy Fox. But they adopted the symbol. Um, the symbol today is very much associated, not simply because of Anonymous, um, with kind of revolution, with left causes, it's kind of like a positive symbol. But really, for much of British history, um, Guy Fox had a really negative reputation. So for those that may not know, um, Guy Fox was part of the gunpowder plots to blow up Parliament in 1605. He was hung, drawn, and quartered in London. And the 5th of November, remember, remember, was to commemorate not how cruel he was, but how bad he was. Right? And so to put it in the most simplistic terms, you know, um, it's not like a perfect analogy, but he was kind of considered a terrorist and a really evil kind of character. He was like Britain's Osama bin Laden for a couple of centuries, right? And there was a whole ritual apparatus of historical commemoration to fix that symbol and that history. And over uh, many hundreds of years, we then um, have a new rendition of Guy Fox that is far more positive, right? And in part, the graphic novel by David Boyd and Alan Moore, and then 
I would say especially the Hollywood film, which reached a lot more people, is um, both an indication that Guy Fox doesn't have those purely negative associations and help to make that transformation, right? But it's actually a really complex story of how that transformation happened. And this is somewhere where I need to do um, some history, uh, historical work. Uh, but I also want to propose a kind of anthropological mechanism about why or how Guy Fox could go from such a kind of negative to sort of positive character. But and um, I'm going to now show you a quote by Alan Moore that I just really like that captures that transformation. Um, so as mastermind behind the terrorist outrage du jour, however, the plot's nominal leader Guido Fox rapidly replaced the pontiff and the hate master of choice of these occasions. Jump forward 300 years, though, to the battered post-war England in the 1950s, and the Saturnine insurrectionary had taken on more ambiguous connotations. When parents explain to their offspring about Guy Fox and his attempt to blow up Parliament, there always seemed to be an undertone of admiration for their voices, or at least there um, did in Northampton. While that era's children perhaps would see Guy Fox as a hero, they certainly didn't see him as the villainous scapegoat he had originally intended to be. And obviously, Alan Moore has really helped to make sure that he's not seen as a villain. But it wasn't only Alan Moore. It started much earlier, the kind of reconfiguration of the symbol of Guy Fawkes. And so one of the first books to treat Guy Fawkes in a positive way is this historical novel, Guy Fawkes or the Gunpowder Treason. Um, and there was also children's books which I think are particularly important because, you know, you know children are questionable. And so this was around the mid-1800s, um, where people start to kind of really take them on a, tr a different trajectory. And Alan Moore is kind of the end of that chapter, but that chapter starts earlier. Now the question is, why did this even happen at all? That's the part I need to research. But one of the fascinating things is that um, when Guy Fox was burnt in effigy um, to kind of commemorate, again, his role in the gunpowder plot, um, and this is a nice piece about you know, how he has more positive than negative uh, connotations. What I'm interested in is the use of the mask. Um, because there's a way in which um, the mask was uh, sold so that people could burn them in effigy, but people also started to put on the mask as well, right? And I think that's really, really interesting in terms of maybe a form of identification, if that makes sense. This is, again, historical work that needs to be done, but I think the fact that there was a mask that was being used is interesting. And then if you combine that with the fact that the term guy like, hey, Guy, how are you, was from Guy Fox, right? Um, it's just a man. And it's also the figure representing Guy Fox, burned on boat, um, bonfire. The term Guy comes from Guy Fox. So you went from a kind of particular historical figure to everyone. And a mask, you know, is a great way for all wearing the same mask to be that same collective. So what I'm trying to understand is whether the use of the mask by people who um, were burning him and maybe putting on the mask combined with that transformation had anything to do with the transformation that happened. I don't know. I have to do a kind of research about it. But even something like the film, um, V for Vendetta, which I think was particularly important in this story, of transformation just because it was a Hollywood film that reached a lot of people. And if you look at it, you're like, wow, this kind of is pretty revolutionary at some level. At the end of the film, um, Evie, who was kind of like kind of tortured by V, and um, V was her mentor, and you know, V dies at the end of the movie. At the end, she assumes the mask, costume, and the role of her mentor, right? It's, again, the fact that you can take on the mask, that you can become a guy, become this person. Anyway, so I think that there's a lot going on there. Um, that's 
the biggest part of the puzzle. But what I think is also interesting about the use of Guy Fawkes is this. Guy Fawkes was a historical character who then became reconfigured in a novel, graphic novel, and film. Became fictionalized, right? And with Anonymous, you have another kind of loop where you have a non-fiction, an actual movement, that starts to mimic the movie. Um, ooh. Oh, hold on. My power is not on. I'm going to lose power. There you go. Did that work? Sorry. Ooh, shoot. made out of historical reality. Anonymous histor like historical reality They're having like these really interesting conversations 
about direct action, right? And then, in the middle of the movie, the main protagonist starts killing people, you know? And the FBI character is like the positive uh, character. And I was like, wow, did the FBI make this film? You know what I mean? I was even, you know, I was very tired, but I started to cry. I was like really upset, because I was like, oh, finally, a movie about animal rights activists that isn't totally negative. And really, I do think this matters, because this is a way a lot of people consume entertainment and kind of learn about these figures. And again, there's, there's one little exception um, in the uh, animal rights world where there's a recent movie that came out that has a more kind of positive connotation, uh, but it's tended to be rare. Now let's compare this to just some of the recent representations of kind of anonymous or hacktivists in popular um, culture and film, and also more kind of esoteric areas of film and popular culture. And I'm showing a cross-section, I mean, there's a bit more than what I'm demonstrating, but you'll really get a sense of how Anonymous was picked up um, in this sphere. So one of my favorite examples is a German film called Who Am I? No System is Safe. And there's a little hacker group called Clay, and they're trying to outdo Anonymous. Um, and so I'm going to show a clip from the film now. We Hollywood, 
um, to having kind of dedicated shows like Mr. Robot just sort of meant that this figure was really portrayed in a pretty positive way in all these shows. Not that it was 100% positive, uh, but nevertheless a little bit kind of badass, kind of hero, anti-hero figure. And I think this made it, I think, a bit more difficult to um, portray Anonymous as being a terrorist force in the world. All right, I'm wrapping up. So the next reason has to do with actual terrorists. Uh, called ISIS. Um, so ISIS uh, became quite big and visible on social media at the same time that Anonymous was also on social media as well. And in particular, uh, you might recall there was a period of time where ISIS was even sharing some very violent and gruesome videos of beheadings uh, that were appearing on Facebook and Twitter. Um, companies kind of helped to, to stop that, but there was a period of time where the kind of gruesome material violence of terrorism was circulating at the same time as anonymous imagery was circulating. And I think in a lot of uh, the public who was following both sets of images, they can kind of differentiate between the two. And in fact, I think that, you know, many people saw ISIS as like these scary terrorists, whereas a lot of people tended to think of Anonymous as like the fat, chubby uh, hacker at home, you know, who is really not threatening. I actually don't think that stereotype is totally real, um, but nevertheless, probably helped to inoculate Anonymous against the idea that they were terrorists because they were just like fat, nerdy hackers at home, you know? And so the juxtaposition of both the violent imagery compared to what Anonymous was circulating, kind of stereotypes of the hacker uh, certainly helped. But then, uh, what happened next was also important, which was Anonymous launched operations against uh, terrorists. This came after the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris, and then especially after the subsequent attacks. But all of a sudden, if Anonymous was fighting the terrorists, well, they couldn't be the terrorists, right? Um, and, uh, they did some interesting things, like break into some ISIS uh, Twitter accounts, and they put gay porn, you know. <laughs> and I think a lot of people were like, wow, you know, Anonymous, they have a sense of humor, ISIS not so much, right? <laughs> so the, juxt the, the juxtaposition of the violence, the humor, uh, I think also worked in Anonymous's favor. So that's part of the story. But now to really finish, I'm going to concentrate on a single event that I found particularly important. Um, and so for those that follow uh, obscure copyright laws, you might remember that much of the European world and the world was considering to ratify the anti-counterfeit trade agreement in 2012, uh, early in the year. And in particular, this was very unpopular in Poland, and there was mass street protests against a government who looked like they were going to pass the ratification of ACTA. There was up to 10,000 people on the streets in Poland. So again, because Anonymous gets involved in many different things, they called Operation um, Anti-ACTA. So welcome to Operation Anti-ACTA. We encourage you to spread the word of Anti-ACTA far and wide. The top priority is to steal and leak any classified government information, including emails and documentation. Prime targets are Polish government websites and other high-ranking establishments. So, protests on the streets, Anonymous is attacking the government websites. Um, this is like, I think in January, February 2012. And then what happened next is so important. What happened next was this. A group of left Polish parliamentarians decided to say, no, we don't support ACTA, and they took Guy Fawkes' mask to protest it, right? And this was in the midst of Anonymous, who was um, hitting the Polish uh, government websites with DDoS attacks. And this was really significant for many, many different reasons, right? First of all, um, having the Guy Fawkes mask in government chambers is an incredibly big deal, right? Uh, and 
I think that Anonymous also reflected on why this was a big deal, and this was a blog post made by one Anonymous participant who wrote, Anonymous is not unanimous, an opinion on distributed denial of service attack is perhaps more divided than any other tactic. Indeed, this very faction, in consultation with the anti-ACTA NGOs, has been calling for a halt to DDoS for the last several days, but after this photo of the Polish politicians protesting ACTA went viral yesterday, it's time we all reevaluate the role and legitimacy of DDoS. These parliamentarians were wearing anonymous by Fox masks, while the parliament website was down due to a DDoS by anonymous. We can't emphasize the point enough, this is a game changer. And it was precisely a game changer uh, because it legitimated the tactics, the collective, and again, the icon of the Guy Fox mask. I think it's very difficult to sort of say, oh, Guy Fox is a terrorist, if you know, elected officials in a democratic country are using the mask, right? And so it is not surprising to me that a couple weeks after that um, image was circulated, and that image was really, really widely circulated, you know, that this story in the Wall Street Journal um, comes out, where the U.S. government is like, oh, anonymous, they will have the capability to attack um, the electrical grid. Now, of course, I can make no realistic connection about the fact that uh, the symbol most associated with anonymous was used in government chambers, and the fact that at, you know two weeks later, the US government plans what I think is a false story. There was no credible information um, whatsoever, and in fact, most security uh, specialists and hackers, many who really dislike Anonymous, were kind of calling BS, bullshit, on the story. Um, I can't help but think, you know, the paranoid sort of, um, person inside me is like, well, the government felt like they were losing the propaganda battle. Let's put out some really negative information for, about Anonymous out there. Again, I'll never be able to prove it, uh, but it's conceivable that that could happen. Right? It just seems like the timing uh, is not accidental by any means. Right? And you know, maybe it was accidental, and if it is accidental, then the fact that it came a couple weeks after the icon most associated with Anonymous was used in the government um, chambers just made it really hard for people at the time to see Anonymous as an evil menace. So that's pretty much the reasons in the empirical story. I just want to say a couple of things, and then maybe we can open it up to questions and comments. So, um, first of all, just because Anonymous in the period between 2010 and I would say today has not been painted as cyber terrorists, the tides can change very quickly. All you need is one you know, bad attack against some critical infrastructure, which I do believe can happen. It's a real kind of serious threat. Um, I do think it can cause a lot of uh, damage, even possibly loss of life. If in any way there is an attack that then becomes associated with anonymous or hacktivism, that can be like the end of the happy story, right? So the, the pump has been primed for 30 years. Um, and so the story I'm telling now, you know, can be a chapter with a very dark chapter that follows under slightly different conditions. Um, I also think that you don't need the terrorism label to have state repression of computer hackers. The movement today, especially in the United States um, and parts of Europe, has been significantly dampened by some pretty uh, big arrests. Jeremy Hammond, who is one of the hackers most involved in Anonymous, um, was given a 10-year jail sentence. That's a very long time. I think in total he'll have eight years. Uh, and there was other people like Barrett Brown, who uh, never engaged in any hacking. And a little bit like the Shaq 7, he was kind of more a media person involved in Anonymous, uh, did five years in jail and has a million dollar fine, right? So you don't really need the label. Um, it certainly helps because, you know, I've had everything from um, friends eight-year-old kids who have drawn like an anonymous mask and said positive things and my friends like send it to me. You know, there's indications that anonymous does have like this um, popularity out there. 
And if it didn't have that popularity, it would be worse off for anonymous. But something like state repression can really work to um, disable a movement as well. And I think in the case of the English-speaking world, that has already happened. Um, so those are just the two kind of final points I wanted to make about this story. Um, and I'll leave it at that. And, and maybe if people still want to stay and ask some questions, um, I welcome any questions. So thank you. <laughs>